what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, and this one is a little bit different episode. This episode is actually going to go on the Fire Belly Social Show. It'll also go on Inspired Insider, and um, so this is going to be a little bit different. So I am the founder of Inspired Insider. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I always like to tell people to check out past guests. I'm here with my friend, colleague, um, Duncan Olney, who I'm going to introduce in a second. But Duncan, just uh, tell people about your show for a second. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I always love uh, doing anything with you, whether it's like, you know, uh, running around in Colorado on the top of the mountains or getting on the podcast with you. Uh, you're a great human. Um, yeah, so my podcast is uh, the Firebelly Social Show. And, you know, probably obvious that it's about something social. And uh, we are a social media marketing agency. And uh, we talk to some of the, I talk to some of the you know, leading uh, entrepreneurs and founders in the food and beverage space, especially mission-driven companies. Who are some of the episodes people should check out on your show? You know, that's a great question. I interviewed, um, I interviewed um, Asma Khan uh, a few months ago, and she's an iconic uh, restaurateur in London, you know, who is, uh, you know, using uh, food to, uh, for social justice and uh, a, a very difficult restaurant oh. to get into in London. And uh, Rusty Jones is another founder of a water company and uh, Brandon, uh, creative director of uh, One Hope Wines. Um, you know, some really cool, Jessica Hirschfield from Just Enough Wines. So some people that are really doing interesting things in the food and beverage space. Very cool. And, um, you know, I like to also mention past episodes. Check out, and, and Duncan, I like to have the people and companies I admire on my podcast, like what you're doing at Firebelly and some other ones, um, uh, Dodd. Okay. If you've heard of Moon Clerk, you know, I love Dodd Caldwell, Moon Clerk. You know, I had him on. I love their company. We talked about how he started the company, et cetera. That was fun. Uh, I had Tracy DeForge on, who um, runs a, an amazing business called the Players Impact, where they have uh, prof- ex professional athletes uh, invest in these uh, companies. So you check her out. And Elon Gold, one of my favorite comedians in the world. Shout out to Jason Cement. Um, I was talking to him, Duncan. I was like, you know what? After all of my VC Israeli interviews, I always send Elon Gold's stand up bit because he, in a nice, sarcastic way, pokes fun at Jewish people and Israeli people. And so I would send them that, these hard, kind of like, you know, hard business Israeli VCs to lighten the mood. Um, and he's, and Jason said, I know Elon Gold. Do you want to have him on the podcast? I go, of course I do. And so I had him <laughs> on, he did some amazing imitations. And so um, we will get to talking about Duncan's company. And this episode is brought to you by Firebelly. Um, and at Firebelly, they make brands more likable and profitable through social media marketing. They do organic and paid social strategies along with influencer marketing to help you get ROI. They were named one of the top 10 social media agencies in the world of Clutch. You've heard of Clutch. Um, and you know they do amazing work. So check them out. They've worked with Netflix, Qdoba, Fiji Water, and as Duncan was mentioning, other mission-based brands. And you can go to firebellymarketing.com or email them at hello at firebellymarketing.com. And as you know, if you've listened to my podcast as well, um, Rise 25, we help businesses connect to their dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, And Duncan, you're the same way. For me, relationships are the number one thing in my life. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade than to profile them and what they're working on on my podcast. So if you've thought about it, check out rise25.com. Email me anytime, open to answer any questions that you have. So let's get rocking. Um, I kind of wanted to start with, I, I took so many notes and a shout out to Drew Hendricks and his podcast. I was listening to his podcast with you to study for this, to see what should we be talking about. And we're going to talk about strategies on social, because I think there's low hanging fruit in certain social channels that people are not using. We're going to talk about that. 
Um, but I want to start with, you made a comment on Drew's podcast that stuck out to me. Okay. And you said, I moved from India to become a cowboy. <laughs> I did say that. So what did you mean by that? <laughs> I thought I could wang a lot of answering it, but I guess you're going to press it. You know, uh, I grew up in India and, uh, you know, I, um, I grew up in Calcutta, which is a very, you know, cosmopolitan, you know, maybe the most, uh, uh, in some ways, advanced place in India to me anyway, or Kolkata. And, you know, I used to dream about, um, you know, America. And um, I wanted to go to America and I wanted to experience that life. But then I wanted to specifically feel that cowboy vibe, you know, because I'd seen it in movies. And I wanted to, you know, uh, wanted to be a cowboy. I mean, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, on arrival, a final, final arrival in Montana, you know, after years of living in America, I made it to Montana and I was like, uh, you know, investigating that life. And I realized that not being able to ride a horse is a critical challenge when it comes to being a cowboy, you know? And so, you know, your life may be in the office of a modern ranch, or, you know, I guess I still have hope, you know, it could be a market here for ranches, which we actually have an amazing ranch client. So I have realized my dream in some ways, but, you know, you may be relegated to stubbling shit, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's what I wanted to do, but it really, it wasn't about, I think, as I've reflected on this over the years, it's less about, you know, wrangling um, horses and, you know, going to rodeos and all that is more, I think, about what, you know, uh, cowboys, um, good cowboys, um, what good cowboys represent to me, which is sort of that uh, pioneer, you know, spirit forging westward, um, you know, rugged individualism, you know, the ability to, to like Alexis uh, e. Tocqueville said back in the day after traveling in America, you know, the ability to move freely you know, without encumbrance. So that's not necessarily, you know, real for me to move freely without encumbrance. But um, that was it's sort of the ideal, the American ideal in my mind. So it kind of represented for you the American dream, in a sense. I was going to say diametrically different than the interconnectedness, um, vastly deeper interconnectedness of like the fabric of Indian culture. Uh, yes, the American dream, correct. Mm. Yeah. And I and feel so, like, you know, being, being an agency owner, you're always a cowboy because you're wrangling people, you're wrangling clients, you know, you're wrangling all kinds of things. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm like, I, I've known um, for you, you for a while and I had no idea that was the case. So that kind of stuck out to me in that interview. And that's what's, what's cool. And, um, you know, you could check out Drew. I didn't even mention his website. Shame on me. Uh, Barrelsahead.com. You could check out more on what he's doing there. Um, but you know, one of the things that also stuck out in that conversation, again, I love low hanging fruit uh, of what people should be doing that are maybe missing the boat and they're not doing. And you talked about on the interview, um, Pinterest. Okay. For me, and I don't know, in your world, you're all about social. And I'm like, I'm neglecting this channel. And I, I imagine a lot of people are neglecting this channel a lot because people talk about Google, they talk about Facebook. And I think Pinterest is, I mean, is up there in the top five or so. I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know. I, I was reading somewhere when you said that, I was like, Pinterest is really popular. There's a lot of people on Pinterest and I think it gets neglected. So what are your thoughts on Pinterest? And I'd love to hear about strategies on Pinterest. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I, I second your emotion about Drew Hendricks being uh, an, an amazing guy. And he, he just turned 50 a couple of days ago. So happy birthday to Drew. We're aging him. He's got a great, great experience set um, in the wine space. And so, you know, if you're listening and you want someone to work with in the wine space and marketing specifically, he's a great guy. Um, but I think that, you know, um, Pinterest is, well, well let's, let's take a step back. You know, socialism is a very crowded space in terms of like the dominant players, right? When you think of the dominant players today, you think of, you know, three, you think of Facebook, you think of Instagram and you know, this sort of like um, unfamiliar giant, you know, TikTok where it's, there's a lot of chaos and, you know, the, the models are sort of still emerging. Um, we, uh, we started looking at Pinterest very seriously a couple of years ago. And um, for a couple of reasons, you know, we sort of seeing some of the um, challenges from a risk standpoint with putting everything into Facebook and Instagram, which, you know, candidly, we 
we followed the market and the market was heavy with Facebook and Instagram. And then uh, I decided that we're going to maybe lead some of our clients in a different direction, manage your risk. Let's get onto a, a platform that candidly is, is better for food and beverage. Now, having said that, it's a longer play, you know, so you're not going to, you may not monetize tomorrow on, on Pinterest, but some things have changed on Pinterest. You know, they've got this sort of fleeting, um, you know, transient um, versions of stories or, or fleets, you know, uh, where uh, it's um, the idea pen. You know, so they're you know, present for a much shorter amount of time. You know, video is big and the audience has changed to probably 45 percent male. It's a large audience. Uh, it's on Pinterest. Studio. On Pinterest, yeah. Wow, that's shocking. And food and beverage, uh, you know, beauty, um, do-it-yourself kind of things. Those are the top categories, the top three or four categories um, on Pinterest. And so uh, that led us down that path. And um, I don't know if this is the right time to say this or not, but, you know, we are working out with a company in the bicycle space, and, you know, as you say, personal transportation. and. Um, I just have to say that personal transportation. Um, that sounds but, very um, official. You know, it's it it was it was a layered program. You know, with um, you know posts and boards, or you know uh, pins and boards, and you know doing some engagement, intersecting with other brands and affinity brands, and um, we started doing ads. And um, you know, we were able to with a with a tiny spend, able to generate you know um, one hundred twenty five thousand dollars in revenue for them. I mean, that's not a number to sneeze at, right? And so that really changed our perspective and like, uh, this is a great opportunity, but like anything else, you know, the strategy <laughs> is almost easier sometimes with these kinds of things than the day-to-day -day tactics because the day-to-day -day tactics are changing and, uh, you know, it's like, a, it's like a, uh, I think the right word is estuary, right? It's like a, the, the delta of a river where, you know, you know, there's a sandbar one day and it's gone the next, you know, there's some sandbars that are like two miles wide and three miles long. And there's others that are five feet, you know? And so I think that that's the sort of uh, ongoing struggle with social is the, um, the ability to like find places to connect with your audience and actually produce some tangible results. And I think Pinterest is, is, and the, and, and candidly, the, the brand team at Pinterest is really motivated. They're easy to work with. Um, less technical difficulties. So yeah, it's a, it's a very compelling, um, and you know, candidly, the, a lot of brands are there, but there's a lot of brands that are not on there. It's still- Yeah, I imagine. I'd love to talk about underutilized channels um, outside of Pinterest, but I was looking it up while you're, you're talking. Like it's, it says, when I looked it up, it says Pinterest is the 14th largest social network in the world. And this was as of January, 2021. And, you know, some of the people above are the people you, you talked about, right? Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Snapchat, you know, those are, uh, but Pinterest is, is in the top, top 14. So, uh, which is, which is huge, right? So I think it's a question of what works for your audience in your niche, right? And so I think that for food and beverage, especially, it's a great, um, it's a great opportunity, you know, so we, um, you know, we, we want people to have a diversified portfolio, you know, where they can build credibility and, and, you know, hopefully find some website traffic and sales. So yeah. interestingly, uh, I think the thing about it is crazy is like how much time people will just spend on there. You know, you're cruising around next thing, you know, you've been on there for an hour. I, um, and Pinterest even ranks at, ranked ahead of Twitter, um, in this. So that's pretty remarkable. Are there any other, other underutilized channels that, you know, your team, you're probably evaluating lots of channels. And I love what you said kind of as a concept and strategy is really the ultimate is just connecting with your members, connecting with your tribe, wherever that is. It could be at a local church. It could be on Facebook. It could be wherever. So what are some underutilized channels? Either it could be on online or offline. I don't know. You probably just, you know, in your process of discovery with these companies, discover some interesting stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, YouTube is, you know, we've been predicting this for years is that YouTube is already big and YouTube is about to get bigger. Uh, you know, I think that somehow YouTube has managed, uh, I think maybe because of the barriers to entry being, there's no age discrimination, right. To, to watch YouTube. Whereas, you know, if you're a kid, you can't necessarily get on TikTok or Instagram. 
unless your parent gives you their phone, right? But with YouTube, you've got a device you can get on. And so I think that YouTube sort of by, uh, by maybe by design and by some serendipity remains a very accessible platform. And so, you know, for example, my kid's 10 and he, you know, he can find anything on YouTube and he watches like self-help videos and he knows stuff and entertainment. I think that, you know, when you think about him, he's sort of like further down that Gen Z, that Gen Z, uh, you know, um, age group. So he's like, you know, just at the end of that, like at the, at the edge of the next one. And YouTube is huge. So I think YouTube is big. Um, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I have sort of this continuous interest in LinkedIn, even for B2C companies, because I think people want to know who's behind the brand. Mm. And like, for example, if you really wanted to know who's behind Coca-Cola, you can figure out who's behind Coca-Cola because you can go on Netflix, Netflix, you can go on, uh, on LinkedIn and you can figure it out. Right. And I think that LinkedIn is a great way to, uh, to, you know, to like hire people and demonstrate your culture and like build partnerships and stuff like that. So when I, when I see B2C companies neglecting that, it's not hmm. at the top of my list to tell them, Hey, listen, you got to consider LinkedIn for other reasons, right? Because you got the greedy market your syndrome, right? I know you had Marty uh, from SiteTune is on here, um, you know, a few months ago, and Alex, um, you know, great, great guys from uh, SiteTune is, and they talk about the greedy, the greedy market your syndrome. It's like I don't know you, but will you get married to me? You know, <laughs> I don't know you, but will you buy my seven thousand dollar product? It's like no. It's like hey, let's get to know each other, right? It's like sure. I mean, some people might buy cars like they buy cupcakes, but most people don't, you know. And so um, I think that. Um, and the other thing I think, you know, is a little bit off um, of what you're saying, but um, there's a lot of chaos with these platforms, right? And the challenge that brands face isn't necessarily being able to get on the platform. They can get on, but uh, how did they sort of like connect uh, with their tribe in, in a meaningful way? And the, the number one challenge isn't necessarily publishing, it's the, the which content uh, to use, right? And so the traditional model is the brand creates all its own content, which is unsustainable, right? Brands can only contain, uh, create so much content, you know, even the brands at the deepest pockets. But there's a whole like UGC model, right? So people are creating content and you use their, their content. And then there's, of course, that kind of the overarching piece above that is the creator model, where there are people that are really good at creating content, they're going to create content for your brand. And of course, the third one, you know, which is the, uh, you know, the contentious one, which is the influencer model, and the influencer has a following and, you know, has some um, ability to influence, you know, behavior, hopefully, and um, they're going to uh, create content for you. So I think that, you know, whichever platform you're on, I mean, so many like Reddit, I think a great platform too, but Reddit is sort of like. Um, <laughs> Reddit you know, is it, right behind in this. I don't know how accurate this is. I'm going to assume everything on the internet is accurate, but this chart is right. It says as Reddit right behind Pinterest as far as the rankings go. So they must be 15th or whatever on this list. So. Yeah, I think Reddit, Reddit is, you know, um, I think their own, um, their own slogan is something like it's the, uh, the something of the internet. What is it? Uh, the, it's the, uh, I can't remember the-, the I'll the, look the, it up the, real quick. Yeah. But you know, it's interesting. Reddit is sort of like, it is, um, it is a, paradox in a way because it is uh, seriously anonymous and and significantly authentic right so are there trolls on reddit oh hell yeah is there humor on reddit definitely you know uh, i mean there's a subreddit for anything from elephant collars to jokes to you know um cats to you know um ibs to whatever you want there are there are groups on reddit and you know, um, there's a new guy who's uh, new, like not necessarily like uh, yesterday, but in the last year or so, who is heading up monetization at Reddit. And so they're doing a lot more interesting things on Reddit. But Reddit r remains a challenge for brands, I think, because, you know, you can't pose on Reddit. <laughs> there's no front end, Jeremy, there's no front end on Reddit. It's like you are who you are. And if you try to be something you're not, they're going to tell you to shred. So that Reddit is also like where certain movements have emerged lately, right? where the whole GameStop thing like came about on Reddit, like Reddit was where all that stuff happened. So I think that, you know, there's that whole thing as well, but, you know, I think Snapchat is, is interesting as well. You know, I just, I, again, I mean, we could go through the whole list, but probably the, the, the core uh, advice I'd give people is like, where are you uh, 
uh, going to be able to connect with people, you know, and part of that isn't just that they're there, but that you're able to cut through the clutter and connect with them, you know, and can you, can you build a sustainable content model? You know, what surprised me with this, um, Duncan, I'm going to, I'm going to, it, it came out Hootsuite put, I'll give credit to Hootsuite because I'm looking at a Hootsuite chart here for a second here. Um, but I'm going to, I'll share my screen in this um, to see if I could just show people if they're interested in looking at it. But what surprised me about this, and I don't, again, I don't know how accurate this is. Let's just for argument's sake, assume it is. But um, WhatsApp on this chart is third, which was shocking to me. So you have Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp. And then Facebook Messenger, Instagram, web chat, TikTok, whatever. I don't even know what that other one is. It looks like QQ. I don't know what that is. But um, WhatsApp, does that surprise you at all that WhatsApp is third here? So it's interesting that we're having this conversation today. I was just thinking this morning how uh, like deeply integrated I am into the WhatsApp world, uh, mainly because we've, we've had clients in other countries. and um, you know, I have a whole network of people in other countries, and especially in India. Um, and so, pe- you know, WhatsApp is almost, it, it not almost, it is a verb at this point, right? So people will say, yo, yo, yo you know, what's up with me later? Um, and people don't even say what's, at least to my untrained ear, they don't even say what's up, they say, what's up, they say what's up, right? And so um, there's all kinds of marketing that goes on on, on uh, what's up. We haven't really looked deeply at that yet. I mean, I see things all the time since I'm on there. Groups are huge. Um, and they're uh, candidly, I mean, it's owned by Facebook, you know, so there's that whole piece there. But mm. um, it's real. I mean, it's definitely big in other countries. Yeah. I mean, Facebook Messenger is much, much bigger. I mean, uh, you know, with the rise of um instant messaging in a, in a stable way, although who knows how secure it, it is. That's, I think, um, a real opportunity. I'm trying to look at that list. It's really small. Um, <laughs> Tele- What's Q- have you heard of QQ? I don't even know what Q. It looks like QQ. I have no idea what that is, but. You know, I, I, to be can't, I mean, honestly, I, I haven't paid attention to it. Uh, Telegram, yeah. we keep hearing about, you know, for all kinds of different reasons. It's supposedly, I've heard both that it's, terribly insecure and that it is secure. So I don't know what the reality is. And I'm personally not on Telegram, but you know, um, yeah, Telegram is another, what's, what are the ones at the bottom of Twitter? It's so funny. The Twitter is Quora, so- Quora is there at Twitter and Reddit. So Quora, I know people, you know, frequent a bunch as well. Um, so yeah, the last ones look like Reddit or it's Pinterest, then Reddit, then Twitter, then Quora. Jeremy, I think that this chart is too big. We needed like a smaller chart. I mean, this is just like too, it's too easy to read this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I think the connection opportunity is how you assess it, right? Because I mean, obviously you can't be on all these platforms. Like even the most sophisticated brands get the fact that they can't. Yeah. It's like FOMO, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I mean, it's interesting how so many even like mainstream agencies and brands are not paying attention, you know, to these other opportunities. You know, I we have colleagues, you and I both have colleagues where, you know, and we were that agency, you know, a couple of years ago where we weren't doing a whole lot outside the main platforms. Now we're, you know, uh, we're everywhere. I want to talk about, you know, which kind of goes into the fundamental piece, which separates um you know, what you do when people contact you, which is the strategy piece. And so I want to talk about kind of your audit and anal, you know, analyzing process when someone comes on, how that works. And, you know, just to, just to wrap up that last conversation, you know, our mutual friend, David Melamed um, is a huge WhatsApp person. I think he says he's got huge groups on WhatsApp, uses it, like you mentioned the groups and, and uh, has a big following of groups on WhatsApp. So There you go. But um, talk about a company comes to you and you start off with kind of auditing what they are doing and analyzing what they're doing. Talk about that process. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a key part of of how we operate. And uh, I'll even say that, you know, uh, hats off, um, you know, to the team at Fire Valley over the last couple of months have taken our own audit, you know, uh, up, uh, several notches to a whole new level of deliverable, but um, you know uh, people like Lauren Johnson, who you know on our team, and Sam Dietz and um, Emily Hines and and Abby and Tatiana, 
have all done a great job. But what what happens there is you essentially it's almost like I, when I tell clients, you know, well, why do we need an audit? And it's like, well, you know, you're in a boat and you are in the middle of a large body of water. And you're not really clear. You know, you're going to an island that's, you know, 600 miles away, but you don't have a clear understanding of what's gone on in the past. Right. You don't you don't know. And so, you know, um, the, what the audit does is it really gives you clarity on what's worked and what hasn't worked, um, you know, from a content standpoint, you know, uh, which kinds of content have, have uh, performed and, and which haven't and what's the opportunity for improvement, you know, where's the engagement coming from? Are there people that are advocates or there are people that are, you know, legacy complainers or trolls, you know, um, all that kind of thing. So, you know, what's, what's happened in the past and then they layer that with a competitive analysis and saying, okay, like these two or three real competitors or, you know, this um, aspirational competitor, you know, what are they doing? Um, and, you know, we look at that as a funnel too. So you're looking at what's happening, you know, from an awareness engagement, you know, uh, website, you know, graphic, uh, you know, if there's any conversion happening, can you look at all that? If we look at the ads too um, and see what's happening there, um, you know, look at what's, what, what you've done with influencers, how is the influencer play? Uh, work, you know, we we call it performance creative, where we're looking at creative that performs, you know, and um, what that does for you, it gives you a sense that when you start looking at those um, trends and look at the data, you start getting a, a sense of what's worked and you know what can we can we extend ourselves into in the future. Then you say, okay, like I know that you know every time I I post a picture, you know, of noodles and there's a cocktail and an apple next to it, that blows up, right? And so let's do more stuff with apples, you know, because let's say it's an, you know, let's show the apple more. Um, and so um, now you're going to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, let's say the strategy that becomes like, you know, feature, you know, the insight is we feature more uh, products off the apples, you know, and also consider like Asian food. Um and then you, we extend that into larger strategy and the strategy could be like, you know, dominate this market or increase, you know, um, increase sales over there or like, you know, in, uh, yeah, uh, you know, improve, improve uh, top of mind awareness, whatever the, the strategies are you know, the, based on objectives. And that, then we get into that. And that's a collaborative process, you know, with our clients. For years, we did strategy on the fly. It's like, we just did it. Uh, we did it and it wasn't always visible to our clients that we were doing it. And so recently, you know, we made a switch into a into a into a very like sophisticated and agile strategy deliverable deliverable where we're doing it every three months, you know, because in social media the whole market can change in three months. So, you know, can we and that's a serious commitment, you know, and it's very hard. <laughs> it's very hard. And you know, I have a great team that works very hard on it. And so um, and we and we're also looking for new people. And so, you know, um, uh, it's been interesting. Uh, we work with some, we collaborate with some, with some top strategists as well. But you know, finding um, strategy people is very difficult. I want to finding finding the quality of strategy people that we want is very difficult. Like you work for two years, you're not a strategist. You 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 may be a very knowledgeable tactician, but you're not a strategist. So a strategist is someone that gets to digital in general, and then also understands social in a very deep manner. We'll talk, I want to talk about hiring because I know right now at this point in time, you are hiring and what you're looking for, but um, you mentioned trends and without divulging company names or anything, I'm, I'm just, when you think back the past couple of years, what was an unexpected trend that you have seen? Like you gave an example, like in a picture, we found that putting an apple in there actually boost. And that may be, again, we're talking for this, whatever individual product that is, and you don't have to say what the product is, but I'm just curious of, because so, you're doing a lot of analyzing every single day. What's been an unexpected trend? It could be in a picture. It could be, I don't know, in content in general. And if people should be considering doing, or at least thinking about uh, as far as their social goes. Jeremy, you have great questions. I don't know that this is these are necessarily unexpected, mm -hmm. uh, but I think, which is like part of our whole uh, brand promise is to make brands more likable. 
Uh, and, you know, you may say, like, why? Why should they be more likable, right? Okay, well, you know, you don't have a choice of whether to engage with the IRS. So it doesn't matter if they're likable or not. But, you know, you have a choice on whether to, to engage with everyone from your local dry cleaner to your grocery store to your car company, right? So um, within that kind of sphere of likability, I think being what well, we, we find unexpectedly and also we can predict it sometimes is that being likable and nice and friendly and helpful on social media just goes so far. You know, when you reach out to a brand and say, hey, what's happening with this? And, you know, they, they help you solve the problem or, you know, there's a complaint and they resolve it. I think that that is, rem- remains unexpectedly sort of like true and relevant. Like, you know, being human uh, wins, you know, putting people first wins. And that's sort of also my part of my key philosophy. But some other ones are, you know, um, I didn't expect Pinterest to explode. Uh, like this for our clients. So Pinterest has been great. Uh, Vertical video and video in general just continue to be amazingly compelling. Uh, We've put, obviously, we work with you and, you know, um, we have a heavy uh, emphasis and view that layered rich content like podcasts um, are the way of the future. I mean, even even shorter content like reels, which is, you know, longer than, you know, a story or a post. it's been interesting also to see the rise of reels and sort of this crossfade that goes on <laughs> between TikTok and reels. You know, my uh, partner, uh, Jeremy King, talks about the crossfade and the the, the mixing, you know, and um, sort of like emojis are greater um, than regular language and memes are greater than emojis, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a new vernacular, right? It's like, this is the creative vernacular and can you speak? And a lot of brands can't keep up with that. Like they can't keep up with that. You know, it's like, don't tell me that you're going to get your testosterone shot. Like show me a picture or just send me a, 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 a GIF of like someone all roided up, right? And I immediately know what you're talking about, right? It's like, you don't have to spend a thousand words. You can send me that one image. Mm. Um, so I think that those are sort of some things that we're seeing. I think um, unexpected for Firebelly that we joined, you know, the ranks of, the less than 1% of agencies in North America that accept crypto. Um, this is unexpectedly something we did. And, uh, you know, it's working out for us so far. Um, so I think like, you know, uh, last year's realization was saying no is good. And this year's realization is when you want to say no, think about whether you could say yes. And what are the terms that you'd want to say yes under? So, um, yeah, so those, you know, you you mentioned one thing that stuck out, Duncan, which is like, you know, responding quickly, um, you know, being human, responding quickly. Is that, you know, I know in the social world, you know, um, you do paid social. Is that what do you do stuff in that realm as well? Is like responding, helping brands respond or. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so um, yeah, in terms of scope of services, you know, we come in, we get people going with their strategy, but then we also, we we help them publish on an ongoing basis. So all their organic work, organic is basically all the messing, messaging that you see on these platforms and bringing all these different kind of content streams together. On the paid piece, it's like where you're paying for placement, right? You're paying to reach more people, you're paying to get in front of people that would click through to go to your client's website, or, you know, you're paying for, you know, more audience, you know, or the opportunity to have people, you know, join your audience as opposed to buying followers, which is always a no, no. So the, the paid piece, you know, it's like, you really can't, in my opinion, have a true social program without a paid piece. And you got a lot of people that don't get it. Well, why should I spend money? Well, you know, you can, it's, there's always a chance something could work for the first time, right? And people can't really do that without paying anymore. The, mm. We work with influencers. Uh, we help identify advocates. Um, um, uh, we, you know, we, we do creative services work, which, uh, you know, photography, video, we're doing design now. So um, it's a, it's an, ex- uh, social is an exciting world. You know, you know, unexpected thing that happened for us is that we figured out how to make social listening viable. You know, so social listening is where you're monitoring keywords um and seeing who's talking about what like your brand you know your brand words your competitors you know other kind of generic terms and um the human element is always a piece that was elusive so the market wanted to pay one thing the cost is ridiculously high and so we figured some of that out 
And, you know, we're not leading the market like my buddy Rob Key at Conversion, you know, who is like, you know, using natural language processing, um, you know, um, and, um, you know, some sort of like um, d- different types of machine learning and, and AI to like predict like what's going to happen based on conversation. Like we're not doing anything like that, but what we're doing is we're making, you know, consistent, um, we're drawing consistent insights based on what people are talking to us or talking about. So, and then community management, which is, you know, we're looking after people's communities, answering questions and stuff like that. And it looks like we're about to go to a 24 hour model, which blows my mind. Mm. You know, I thought that, you know, offering 10 hours of service was enough. And now we got clients saying, Hey, you know, I want someone, I want someone to be answering that 24 seven. So, I mean, you know, you got to remember we're a tiny company We're uh, you know, uh, 10 people about to be, you know, 15 people. I mean, that's a huge amount of growth to go, go through. <laughs> that's like adding 50%, you know? So, uh, and, you know, I'm just, I'm fortunate and blessed that I'm living my best cowboy dream. Community management seems like it would be a popular service um, and very helpful, but let's, let's talk about hiring for a second. Okay. I, I am always intrigued by this conversation um, as a business owner of what people are looking for, how they hire, um, and what do you look for? Uh, you know, we look for, we look for, um, we look for good humans that are looking for, you know, um, some freedom and they're looking, uh, to work within a framework and, and, you know, and some structure, but it's a, it's an agile person that gets social and, uh, you know, they want to be a part of a certain kind of culture. We're not a cult, but we definitely have our own culture. Um, and, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's people that, that get social, that want to work with a values driven company, you know, it's like focus, integrity, reliability, and excellence. And definitely like, you know, as unpopular as it may sound to, for, from a client's perspective, like in my perspective, a client is not always right. There's going to be times when the client is wrong. I'm going to take my team side every time, you know, we want to make sure the client wins, but I'm never going to throw one of my team members under a bus, you know, to keep a client. The clients will come and clients will go. My team is with me. So, um, you know, those are, those are courageous things to say. It goes along with the fire in the belly, right? But um, yeah, you know, that's who we are. And that's why certain kinds of clients want to work with us. Just in case people, someone's listening, um, and we're also talking in a moment of time, what uh, positions are you hiring for now? In case people, someone out there knows yeah, someone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, we're looking for, you know, uh, people that get and want to work in organic social, which is, you know, writing content and sourcing imagery and working with our designer and, you know, putting stuff out, managing the community, you know, drawing insights, you know, contests, all that kind of stuff. Like, you know, you're managing a community really is what you're doing. Uh, Paid social people who get, you know, how does targeting work, you know, how to get something in front of people, how to get them to do something with it, right? That's, and the and the the platforms help you with that, but you still gotta have that instinct, like you know. And and candidly, like paid is it is uh, for a person that is very much into scrutiny. You know, you don't look at the same stuff day in and day out and try to make it better. Um, so you know, someone like me, a little bit of ADD, not not the right person, right? I get the big picture. I know how to move resources and solve problems, but I don't have that level of sophistication when it comes to scrutiny. Um, influence so the, so looking for organic social people we're looking for paid people um we're really looking for you know talented people that you know want to make a difference in social and you know do good work you know duncan uh first of all I, so i have one last question for you but thank you thank you for sharing your knowledge and uh your expertise and stories everyone should check out firebellymarketing.com learn more check out their podcast as well where else should we point people towards online to learn more? You know, I think those are two good ones. The only the, we, We've done some cool stuff in the past. We used to have a YouTube show, Got the Fire, where we interviewed, you know, people in Indianapolis, which is, you know, where we originally based, where everywhere, you know, all over the country now in terms of people. But Got the Fire was a cool little show. And we have playlists. We put playlists together on Spotify, and those have just been named Firebelly Stereo. So it's like, you know, we want to we, we use music to communicate, um, you know, the, the, the build a world around our clients, but also a world around us. You can tell a lot about people by the music they listen to or, or don't listen to, but uh, those are the key places. You know, um, if you, if you type in Duncan Olney, you can find me, um, you know, in a few places too. So LinkedIn, Twitter, 
Instagram, those kinds of places. So this is not my final question because you sparked <laughs> another question, but um, because you mentioned the music, what what is your favorite song or two songs? Like if they're announcing you to speak at this big social conference, what what song do you come out to? What are your uh, favorite? That, favorite? That is an amazing question. And I will, um, I always like to back up my stats by data. And so this is my on repeat <laughs> list. And um, my on repeat list on, on, on Spotify. Uh, I believe in both uh, streaming and like real records and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I have been a, I think if you, if I had to pick the song, the couple songs that have consistently been around, I'm, I'm 53, that have been around my whole life, you know, I would say, Vienna by Billy Joel, which is, you know, a song about like thinking about, um, you know, a visionary, a, a, your vision of where you want to be and slowing down and getting to a place that's always going to be waiting there for you. Um, and uh, every day is like Sunday, you know, by Morrissey <laughs> from the Smiths. But the, 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 what I'm, I don't know, um, you know, I'm really listening to You Ain't Going Nowhere by The Birds, mm. uh, Call Me When You Land by Old Sea Brigade. So those are two that I've been obsessed with. I've been listening to The Love Club by Lord a lot. Um, love uh, Good Year for the Roses by Elvis Costello. Um, you know, I like, I mean, I'll tell you one song that everyone should listen to at least once, although my uh, significant other and son will tell you they're sick as shit of it because <laughs> I play it all the time, is Manifest. It's an Andrew Bird collaboration with Erica Warnstrom, Warnerstrom. And it's about, you know, being at the edge of, you know, great decisions and like sort of like your you know, your destiny and what mm. role you have. In it. And so, you know, I also like, you know, a lot of uh, Indian, you know, uh, chanting. And so. I love it. Thanks for sharing that. So that was not my final question, but because uh, it just sparked <laughs> me because we had a team meeting uh, yesterday and that was, we like to have a question that just to, everyone gets to know each other better. And that was our question, which is, what is your favorite song or what's a song that you would come out to? And, and you get some interesting answers. And I know, you know, my knowledge and expertise of artists and songs is, is slim to none. I love listening to music, but I couldn't name what the song was called of the artist. So um, I was always, I was like looking up what people were saying, but my last question, uh, Duncan, for you is, you know, I know you work with a lot of different types of companies, B2C, um, and I love to hear as of late, there was an appliance brand that you are doing work with. And I'd love for you to just uh, you know, talk for a second about something that was exciting about that campaign or something that was going well um, about that. Yeah, so I'm I'm not at liberty to announce the brand yet. It is a brand that most people would know in the home appliance space. Uh, I'll even go as far as, far as saying it you might find it in your kitchen. But um, they came to us and they said, hey, you know, um, we are a, a, a highly demanding group and we want, you know, uh, we want to know what we've done with social recently and how can we do better? And uh, the, um, the, the head of marketing, you know, a very talented, uh, person, uh, but also said like, listen, you, I, I'm going to need to be convinced. And so, you know, um, our team, you know, and, and, and by the way, all, while all this is going on, I'm leaving to go to India to look after my very sick, um, father and help my mother who's having trouble coping and he has dementia. And so I'm, you know, it's like a life or death situation. So I'm, you know, we, we, we have, you know, some change going on at the company got a new, uh, you know, partner joining the company. And I'm like, okay, see you later. I'm out. We got this opportunity. You guys manage it. And so, you know, uh, Jeremy King, who's our, 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 the partner I'm referring to in, in heading up revenue at Firebelly and Lauren Johnson, who I mentioned earlier, who's um, a longtime Firebelly player and, and some other people on our team who I, again mentioned earlier, took what we did and said, you know what, we're going to know everything we can about what this brand and its competitors have done. And so they did a lot of human analysis. They used uh, you know, several different tools, but what they did was that we were gonna build a build bulletproof audit and analysis of what this brand has done in the last nine months. Now you're gonna understand 
that most, most companies in our position would do three months. They might do six months. And the reason is that that's a lot of data to be looking at. And they did nine months to make it meaningful. And they really produced such a, an amazing set of insights. Not only did it look good, uh, I'm sorry, not only was the substance good, but even looked good. And um, the client said, uh, we don't even want to go through it. We read it and you're hired. And to me, that was, you know, that was just, that, that, that was unexpected. Because you know, typically people want to read it and they want to ask you questions. And so um, I think that's what you were referring to, right? It is. I mean, I wasn't, refer- I wasn't anything specific, but I knew that you'd worked with an appliance brand. Um, yeah, so, and, and, yeah. And, and, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, there's this sort of like, uh, there's this, uh, I think, limiting belief that you got to be big, you know, in terms of revenue or budget size to do big things. And what we got out of that piece that was really great was you can be small and have a big impact, right? It's all about like uh, culture will, how does it go? Culture will eat strategy for lunch. And so um, every day. And so I think it's like, you know, it's like if you have a great culture of feeding people well inside your company, treating your customers well and you know, producing great products, you know, and, and, and great digital experiences to accompany those products that, you know, that's compelling. Like you don't really have to do a whole lot more than that. You know? So um, and that's kind of what we found out was that this company really has its um, shit together. Duncan, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you so much. Um, everyone check out firebellymarketing.com. Check out their podcast. Check out more episodes of Inspired Insider and Rise 25 and all of that. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Duncan. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.